Mm-hmm. Actually, the I last time I really danced, you want to take a when guess? When was the last time like, you like really danced? Really like, I would love loose. to see your like dance moves. sweating on the dance floor. Never. No, I, I'm not. <laughs> what's your, your guess is never? I My have done it before. My you've never danced. No. 1993. You got, like, just like a little like. 1993 <laughs> was the last time. What song was that? No, I specifically remember it was my sister's wedding. Wow. And I, I still. Lisa, am, can I, you get married again? Because I need to see this man dance. I am known for that night. Mm, I was six years old. Were, oh my god. Six years old, and man, I don't know who I thought I was, but I just, I was getting it. That's hilarious. Mad tux. Like, my mom had to pull me off the dance floor. I was That's just, probably where... 93. That was probably the last time you were so pure within yourself. Jesus. <laughs> you were free. Oh, my God. You were free Not from all of your... 30 years ago. No, you were free from all of your traumas. All I didn't of have trauma. Well, exactly. I did, actually. I, I did have traumas That's then. At six years old? Yeah. I had traumas younger than that, okay. unfortunately. But um, maybe you hadn't processed them yet, no, so you right. were still free and like yeah. not controlling of yourself. And now I yeah. feel like you're just like calculated. Calculated. You can't relax. <sighs> Definitely have not you seen him on the dance floor. You make it sound like I'm just some wound up <laughs> robot that's just like nonstop. Let, okay, let me see some <laughs> dance moves. Beautiful people, welcome back to another episode of Who Can Relate. And it pains me and also excites me at the same time, if that's such a thing, that uh, this will conclude season two. And the reason why I say it pains me is because I didn't really like the way I did season two in its entirety. Um, It was inconsistent. It was really out of order. If I even had an order. Um, Sporadic, etc. And that's just not how I wanted to do things. And it was actually the opposite of how I did season one which is very consistent, 50 weeks straight. I was a machine, and uh, <laughs> season two was it was a little bit different. But And it, uh, the happy part of it, I guess, is because, um, you know, I can, I can finally conclude it, and now I can start fresh with season three and build a whole other, uh, you know, momentum train and, and uh, just, just really do it proud. Um, <clears throat> A quick intro before we get into the episode with uh, Shay and I. Uh, I'll keep this pretty brief. I know my intros in the past have been too long. Uh, Let me start off with saying thank you. Uh, Thank you to each and every one of you, part of the community, part of this incredible audience, um, this beautiful support team. Um, You guys have shown nothing but love and support and encouragement throughout this journey. Um, not just for season two, but also for season one. And, but specifically with season two, um, I think it means just as much, if not more, because I was inconsistent and I didn't show up the way I wanted to show up at times. And, um, you guys were still there and, and you were still rocking with me and supporting me and, and it just means a lot. And, um, I'm, I'm full of gratitude for each and every one of you and, and, um, it just means a lot to me. So all the messages that I've gotten and, you know, comments and, and just everything has just been amazing. So thank you to each and every one of you. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, you know, one thing I, I actually learned this week, I'm filming this right now. It's um, Thursday, February 16th. Yesterday, I had a, a really good coaching session. Um, and... I realized that in full transparency, a lot of times while I had these breaks from the show on season two, it was because I didn't know how to show up. If I didn't feel like I could teach or help or guide someone, I thought, I'll just skip this week. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not there. And in this coaching session, I realized that I can still show up in those moments where I don't really feel like a mentor or a teacher. And I can show up in a way where I can just be relatable, (laughs) hence the name. (laughs) And I, 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 for some reason, just didn't think that I, I don't know. I I don't know if I put too much pressure on myself or I I have no idea, really. There's no rhyme or reason. But I just wanted to say that moving forward, that will not happen. And if I can show up in any kind of way, I'm going to show up, whether it's just to relate uh, to feel like I'm, I can be related to or to be a mentor or, or to teach about an experience or whatever it is, I'm going to show up. 
And I know that my vulnerability and transparency has been something that we've aligned with quite a bit here uh, these last three years. And my apologies for forgetting that in those moments. So 2022 was definitely a a year of a lot, a, a year of change, growth for sure. Um, a year of really digging deep and a year of unknown. <laughs> All of these things that are now becoming normalized to me. And I realize that I have to ask, you know, the audience to be okay with that along this ride. You know, season one, I, I don't really think I showed a lot of that. And so season two was, again, a lot of unknown and a lot of change. So <clears throat> thank you for bearing with me and for being patient with me as I figured my shit out. And I really do feel like I figured my shit out, <laughs> at least a, a huge chunk of it. Um, I know the last time we spoke and the last time you saw me, <clears throat> I had Lauren on. And it was basically like a live coaching slash therapy session. And I was kind of going through it with, with some things. And I am so happy and proud to report that so much has changed for the better since that episode. Um, I've, I've really taken 2023 just head on, like uh, grabbing the bull by its horns and completely changing so many things in my life and implementing so many systems that I've, I've found have worked for me. Um, if you didn't watch that episode, one of the things I talked about was, you know, instead of creating just one New Year's resolution uh, and trying to stick to it throughout the year, I wanted to create a new resolution for each month of the year. So in essence, I'd have 12 for 2023. And my January was waking up at 5 a.m. every day. And I'm still sticking to that, even though it's February 16th. And I, I have no plans on changing that, by the way. Another system I implemented was working out at least five days a week, whether it was um, training with my trainer, training with myself in the gym, uh, doing hot yoga classes, um, but just make or going on a hike or a run, just something five days a week, um, closing all three rings of my Apple Watch, you know, th these kind of things. And my goal was to read a book a month. And in January, I ended up reading three and a half because I was waking up at 5 a.m. And because I would read for an hour a day, I guess they created three and a half books um, in, in completion. And February's goals are um, doing cardio three days a week, uh, non like training cardio, but like dedicating, you know, um, three days a week for cardio. Um, I'm going to do a five day juice cleanse here coming up. And um, my goal was to read four books for this month. And I just finished uh, book number two. I, I bring this up because in one of the books I read in January, um, something really stuck with me that I want to give to you all. And this author talks about how we come up with these goals constantly that we have. And it's for good reason. It's good, good intention, right? It's to motivate you to stay on track, maybe to change something about your life you don't really like. And he said, but the thing about goals that is different than systems is goals have an expiration date. And when you complete this goal, you feel in some way, shape or form that it's now over with and done. And he said, if you can replace the word goal with system, the system never ends, it never dies, there's no expiration date. It continues on throughout your life. And so I started the new year with goals for each month and I've changed them now to systems. And again, waking up at 5 a.m., as I've realized, is such an important system in my life to keep me optimal in my mental health, my emotional health, and definitely my physical health. Um, implementing the system of training five days a week has obviously helped in my physical health, but it's also helped in my mental health as well, as we know what endorphins do to, you, to your brain once you work out. Reading has been a, a huge system in my life. Um, I'm even realizing that I'm able to articulate things better. I'm able to explain things in ways that I, I never could as quickly as I, as I could in the past. Even my reading level and, and the rate at how fast I'm reading is changing. Um, it's a huge part of my system now for life. And last but not least, these systems have helped in every aspect of my life. My relationship with Shay has been 
just beautiful and it's it's really blossomed in a way that it hasn't before and it's really cool to see because we're coming up on year six of knowing each other three and a half years of marriage so to still continue to see newness and, and growth is um it's really cool and it's really beautiful uh my relationships have changed in other uh aspects of my life and for the better so all this to say as i wrap up season two i give some explanation as to what my mindset and what really happened for me during season two, um, a lot of downs more so than ups, and here I am today. So this is just me being transparent with you all, me being vulnerable with you all per usual, I know, shocker, and I don't know, I, I just felt like I owed it to you. You know, w- when I think about the Who Can Relate community and the audience, I don't look at you as just a a bunch of strangers. I, I, I swear to you, I, I look at you as part of in in a new formed way my family I mean I really do like there's a lot of you who know more about me than my own family does <laughs> if, if you watch consistently enough there's a lot of you who support me and encourage me and, and give me things that a lot of my family won't even do so I personally consider you a very unique form of my family so just so you know like that's why I take this sh- so seriously and I and I am this is my baby you know and and we are family and so the point is I love you guys I thank you guys I'm so appreciative of you all and please continue with the messages that you send to me because they they truly mean the world to me that's why I respond to every single one and just thank you thank you for the encouragement and all the support because it I think it what I'm trying to say here is it means more to me. Than I think, you know, so thank you. Okay. Um, last but not least season three is going to be a little different. And I, I would consider good ways. Number one, I'm going to go 15 episodes I went 50 for season one, 25 season two is going to be 15 season three. Secondly, Shay will be my co-host throughout the entire season. Now for the most part, it'll be just her and I probably here on this couch and other times we'll have some other guests come on or maybe we do a virtual thing. But from all the research that I've done with you all and, and all the feedback, I know how important Shay is to this family as well. And so I thought it would be great for us to just come on and, and either talk about our relationship, topics that maybe you guys send in or topics that I've come up with. And I have some really good, strong, maybe eight to 10 topics Um based on some research that I did that I think you guys will really, really, really enjoy. And I think it'll really benefit you all. So without further ado, thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to each and every one of you for all the love, all the encouragement, all the support. It means more than you know. It never goes unnoticed and I never take it for granted. So thank you again. I hope you enjoyed this last episode. It's pretty good. And I think you'll have something to take away from. I'll see you in season three sometime in March. Hoodies will be available sometime in March. (laughs) Uh, And uh, if not sooner, I'll let you know. And uh, I'll see you soon. Just gonna roll into it. Roll on in. What if when we move to Texas, Yeehaw. I get a little southern draw? <laughs> Pooch! <laughs> Pooch! <laughs> you need to you need to cut that out. Pooch. Otherwise, we're going in the vehicle. And you're going back to the groomer. Now, hush, pooch. Hey, 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 hey. Come here. (laughs) He's frustrated. (laughs) Why now? Hey.
All right. <clears throat> Let's uh, toddlers. go. <laughs> toddlers. Toddlers. You know, like when kids have, when parents have kids and they're oh. like, the kids are acting up. They're like, oh, toddlers. These damn kids. <laughs> All right, honey. Welcome back. <clears throat> it has been a while. Oh. Since you've been on. Um. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> Just so everybody knows for the record, I try. I really try to bring you on as, as frequent as often. And it's just hard. He never asks me. It's just hard. Shay is busier than busy. So it's tough. Okay. Um, let's get into it. So originally, Shay and I had filmed what we, three weeks ago now. We attempted to film an episode <laughs> on conflict resolution, and it turned out just to be all conflict and no resolution. <laughs> and it was rough. Couldn't even put it out there. Um, so after we talked it out and learned a lot and, and unlearned a lot, we realized a couple things. Rocket is out. And the first thing is that there were a couple incidents that happened over the fall last year, um, mm -hmm. as I have alluded to every now and then about, you know, Shay and I weren't in a good spot at that time. And without getting into too much detail, um, when we were filming this, this conflict, resolution, mm -hmm. conflict resolution episode three weeks ago, I personally realized that I didn't forgive you yet. Mm -hmm. Um for what transpired and I wasn't healed yet. And so <clears throat> in part of the forgiving and healing and moving forward process, um, I realized that a lot of, of what I was feeling was hurt. I was just really hurt. Um, and, um, it was tough because, you know, we had the incidents that happened and then we had moved on and we were good. And then it was like right back all over again. It was like too soon kind of thing. And we're here today to basically kind of give you all what worked for us <clears throat> um, for the most part and maybe will work for you. And hopefully help some people out. <laughs> I was just going to ask, are you healed now? Uh, yes. Have you forgiven me? I have forgiven you. And I am healed enough to move forward. Um, and hopeful that we'll continue on our good path. So, some of the key things that we realized during this time was, first things first, in our time of conflict and, and disagreeing, we realized that Che was really focused and honed in on the facts of the issues at hand. Mm -hmm. I was focused and honed in on the feelings part. And after, you know, we had this episode where we tried to film and didn't work out, mm -hmm. I just kept feeling like, God, like she just didn't even validate or care about my feelings. You were so fixated on these facts. And I remember thinking just in, in short, I was like, I wish it was feelings over facts at times because sometimes the facts don't necessarily matter or mm -hmm. they're not as important as the feelings. Sometimes they will be. But in this particular case, I remember thinking and like, man, I, I need the feelings right now over the facts. When I brought that to you. Um, you brought it to me with facts, though. <laughs> so that's where I, I was. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I'm saying like when we had kind of come back like yeah, a week and a half ago. On, on the video. No, no. A week and a half ago, I'm saying. Oh. Oh, later. Yeah, 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 later. I yeah. thought you were talking about when we were recording. Yeah. Yeah, when, yeah. So how did it feel when I brought the that to the table? Like, look, I think it's, it's so much. I think it's received different because I think where I got stuck in the facts is because you were presenting it with your facts, your version of the story, rather than just your feelings. Mm -hmm. So I then was like, your version of the story isn't actually what happened. That's just what you have created in your head to be the story based on your feelings. You some, know? Of, some of it, but some yeah. of it, like one of the particular 
things for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. And then we were just like in that vicious cycle. Um, but I think when you come with your feelings, it's just received so much, so much better. And I feel like this is probably a very constant and common thing that a lot of couples get into. It's like that, that dance, that vicious cycle rhythm of a dance that you can get into where it's like the problem becomes the dividing, um, Factor. factor of the, of the issue. Yeah. Rather than just really allowing each other to use the empathetic listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, once we had a couple of weeks that went by and I was able to articulate my feelings and kind of set the facts aside, it really helped us out. And Mm -hmm. once you were able to listen with empathy and uh, we were able to like really sit down and at this point it was like, I think we were two weeks removed. So, you know, time to process and think clearly um it really helped but again it it was all about these this feeling over fact Mm -hmm. analogy here and i guess i it's a time to just kind of challenge the audience to to really think about that because how many times do you do you all have an issue with your partner or it could just be a friend maybe you're single by choice and it's just a friend moment right now but the argument escalates to a point where it's just factual. Mm -hmm. No, I said this. No, it's not what I said. And and no, you took it. It's just like facts, Mm -hmm. facts, 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 facts. In reality, the feelings are just being totally ignored and Mm -hmm. dismissed, which the more they are ignored and dismissed, the more you come to the table with more facts. Yeah. (laughs) Only to try to get your feelings up here to the root of of, the surface rather than from the root. And it's really tough. And you have Mm -hmm. this this merry-go-round that can go for however long you allow it to go. Yeah. I think as much as like the person on the receiving end has to has to listen with an open heart, the person on the delivery end also needs to make sure they're not bringing their feelings with like a level of criticizing or a level Mm -hmm. of like their version of the story, because naturally I feel like the other person is just going to want to defend what they're Mm -hmm. saying rather than if, you know, I think you recently said you had a situation happen. I don't know how much you can describe like with like a couple that you saw. Oh, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like maybe like for an example, you said you recently consulted with a couple. Yeah. And it was up until like when, you know, um, I'll let you kind of describe like what happened. But I feel like that's like a perfect example of what the difference can make. Yeah. Yeah. This couple, I'll keep them anonymous, but um, we'll call them uh, Jim and Jill, okay? Um, There was Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill. (laughs) Just kidding. So, um, can't say master bedroom (laughs) anymore. We can say Jack and Jill. Um, Actually, you can't. You could probably, because what if it's Jack and Jack or Jill and Jill? Right, exactly. (laughs) So, for now, we'll say Jack and Jill. Nobody (laughs) get upset, but... Um, They and they. They and they. (laughs) And basically, um, they were out and uh, there was a kind of a mutual friend, more of Jack's friend, that had um, showed up to this event, this outing. And and this this friend is kind of like a firecracker, like a loose cannon, always runs his mouth, kind of a a bully, just just that guy, you know, that annoying guy. And... Uh, one thing led to another and this annoying guy and Jill got into an argument. And during the argument, Jill felt as if Jack wasn't protecting her, defending her, sticking up for her. And Jill felt that Jack was so concerned about how he'd be perceived to the other people out that night and less concerned about Jill and her feelings. um, It really upset her and it made her, hurt and Jill also mentioned that this is in the consultation now you know because I I originally was brought to this they said hey we have an incident that happened so um, I started with Jack I wanted him to go first with what happened with the incident and once he was done and felt good about it I went to Jill and I said Jill I'm going to challenge you you know we're just doing a little exercise here because we got the facts from Jack and I need to know more the feelings because I, I need to hear your feelings here, and I think Jack does too. Did she agree with how Jack told the story? Uh, mm-hmm. not, nec- not 
all the way. You know, she obviously had her facts too, mm-hmm. but I said, look, at this point, the little details, they, they don't even yeah. matter. Let's just go with the feelings here. So we did this exercise and Jill did a beautiful job explaining her feelings. Again, she didn't feel protected. She also said she felt like she had to bring out her masculine side, even though her man was there who should have brought out the masculine side. Mm-hmm. She didn't really like that. And then the biggest thing that I took away and, and everyone there did was this firecracker that was this bully who was arguing with Jill triggered Jill and reminded the whole incident reminded her of her time with her ex, mm-hmm. which is a very traumatic experience for her. So she's listing all these feelings that she has. And I'm looking at Jack and I go, did you even know any of this? Because Jack was more like, oh, you're upset that you guys were arguing where you brought this on to you. And, and, you know, you asked for this and, and, and Jill this whole time is like, what? I was going to say by the, but the, by the way Jack is delivering it, it's making her feel by the way Jack is delivering it to her. Like, well, you brought this on and you're the one who started the argument. It's like Mm -hmm. that makes somebody want to defend with facts with. Yeah. So I think if, if, he wouldn't have done that i think she would have felt more of a safe place to express her feelings yeah and not just feel like she needs to defend the facts of like how it happened and why she got so upset and all of that yeah exactly that's a good point so once now you know the feelings were laid out jack was able to he and i saw him he sat back when she said like it reminded me of my ex and he was like well i wasn't even thinking about Mm -hmm. that like you know, and he, you could tell it hit him and he was remorseful and apologetic. And, and I said, you know, Jack, now that you've heard Jill's feelings, do you understand now you're having a feelings conversation? Mm-hmm. It's no longer about having a factual conversation. It's about the feelings. And he brought up something like, well, I can't control, you know, this loud mouth firecracker, what comes out of his mouth. They said, you're right. You can't. Yeah. And in every other instance, you probably will never be able to control. But what you can do is mm-hmm. take ownership and your responsibility as her man, as her mm-hmm. partner. In that moment, protect her. In that moment, defend her. In that moment, have her back. Mm-hmm. In that moment, who cares about what people think about you? All you care about is your partner in this situation. And he, you know, he was processing, letting it sink in and stuff. And, you know, on some like, you're right. And I mm-hmm. never looked at it like that. So I bring this example. Well, you brought it up. But I explained this example because it just, I want people to know, like, a lot of times you have to ask, you know, once it gets escalated, like, hey, do we need to have a fact conversation or a feeling conversation mm-hmm. right now? Because I just need to know how to show up. Mm-hmm. And I told him, I said, now that you know it's a feelings conversation, you can ask Jill, mm-hmm. hey, how can I show up for you now? Do you want to address that this triggered you from your ex? Do you want to mm-hmm. address that you had to be more masculine than I was in that moment? How can mm-hmm. I show up? Because now it's a direct yeah. line and a path. Like now I'm clear on what I need to do mm-hmm. as, as opposed to the other way. It's interesting because most people it's easier for people to express them s- their their hurt and their feelings through actions rather than just words, you know? Um, what do you mean? Can you unpack that? Like, instead of, like, Jill saying, I am hurt, I mm-hmm. felt this, I felt that, she's probably getting worked up, and it's creating an actionable feeling. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't really know how to describe that, but I feel like she probably expressed through more actions where it's, like, and then expects Jack to receive that she's hurt and yeah. it, it, it upset her and she felt whatever she felt, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, rather than her just saying, you know what, Jack, like what, how you didn't do this or whatever. I don't know. After that, it really made me feel A, B and C. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, like we were in this consultation, me and Jack and Jill, and <laughs> I said, look, you know, cause it w- they got really quiet cause you <laughs> could tell they were just like, whoa, like I wish that would have happened, you know? And I said, look, we're Mm -hmm. here in hindsight. It's some two or three weeks removed from the incident. You're working with a professional. Like we, of course we can come up with the answers now. Mm -hmm. Um, I said, but just hopefully the takeaway here is, is again, asking that question when like nothing is getting resolved and it's just getting heated and heated. Is this a fact conversation or a feeling conversation and who needs to go first? Mm -hmm. And it's actually a good segue. I'm going to reference. That's actually it sounds so easy. Like you're like, Always. Oh, easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when you're in the moment, that's probably one of the hardest things to do is try to really <laughs> remove yourself, your own thoughts, feelings, facts, or whatever they are from the scenario and really listen to someone, you know, pouring out whatever th- it is that they feel. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to reference, uh, <laughs> if anyone watched or listened to the last episode I did with Lauren, 
Um, and if you didn't, you're welcome. It's the book is called Us, and the author is Terrence Real. And I'm on page uh, 208. So I want to reference this because I bookmarked this for good reason and um, highlighted the hell out of these these two pages. I'm going to read off, but basically, what I want to address in this book is um, when he talks about the repair moment. So you have your conflict and then it's like, how do we get to the re- to the repair moment? And in order to repair, he says, first, understand that repair is not a two way street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like, almost everyone gets this wrong. When you are faced with an up- upset partner, this is not your turn. This is not a dialogue. Mm-hmm. So as I said, you know, in the consultation last night and I was telling you, it's not a matter of like, oh, Shay, you're upset? Well, great. Let me tell you why I'm also upset. Like, mm-hmm. it's not a two-way street. It's not your turn. It's well, not, it's like not a dialogue. Jack was saying, well, you're the one who brought this exactly. on. You're the one who started the fight. And it's not about who started what. It's exactly. about how she felt. Yeah, it's about addressing the person yeah. who's hurt. So he said. Again, harder to do. Yeah, easier said than done, for sure. <laughs> he said, you must take turns. Repair goes in one direction. When your partner is in a state of despair, Your only job is to help them get back into harmony with you, to deal with their upset, and to support them in reconnecting. He said, I ask people, when faced with an unhappy partner, to put their needs aside and attend to the other's unhappiness. Why? Because it's in your best interest to do so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because remember, from an ecological perspective, if one of you wins and the other is left lacking, you both suffer. Say that part again. If one of you wins and the other is left lacking, both of you suffer. And that's what I brought up to Jack in the consultation. I was like, so let's say you win. Let's say you, you get your point across. Well, you asked mm-hmm. for this. You started this. It's your fault. And she and Jill says, you're right. What does that do for you? Because she lost. She's lacking. You won. Mm-hmm. So do you both win? Yeah. Does us win or do you when and Mm -hmm. she loses what did you feel when you read that which time i've read this like 17 (laughs) different (laughs) the first time obviously oh no i I, listen if you guys are watching like like you always say you you came from that like that family where it's like always had to win the argument yeah so i background for me i came from a family (sighs) that uh and they they threw haymakers when when they would fight, and it was you know here I am now removed from it, but it was it was rough because <clears throat> you had this constant anxiety going through you, this mm-hmm. anxious feeling of like I have to win, I have to get my point across because this is the last time, and you know you just it was so awful, and these haymakers were being thrown and from like my mother or my sister or, you know, and then I'm throwing them to my mother and my sister. And it was just like, damn, but it was so normalized to me. I was just going to say how, like, how is that process of like reading that, allowing it to absorb enough to like be able to change it in those moments. The first time I read this, (coughs) the first feeling and thought I had was God, I wish I knew this back then. And the second thing I thought of was like, thank God I I learned that there's another way. Mm -hmm. Because it's not fair to you. But now how do you unlearn? <laughs> well, that, that's the biggest thing. And when I constantly bring up in these consultations that I have with people is I'm like, look, as for me personally, as I get older, I realize that it's not learning things is not hard. Like that's that's relatively easy in the grand scheme mm-hmm. of things. What is the most difficult thing that I have found in my now 36 years is unlearning. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you're focused on a particular thing to unlearn versus when you're learning, it's stuff that you're almost absorbing throughout the years. You're not choosing to learn those things. You right. didn't like see your mom acting that way and was like, "Ooh, I want to be like no, that when I grow up. In yeah. you. It's like engraved. And that's that's what's so hard, because this is a proven system that has worked, mm-hmm. worked in a f- messed up way, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's worked. And so it's like. Why would I change this? Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to change it for you. No, you need to get with this system because this system where, and it's just this whole thing mm-hmm. that I have to unlearn. So again, this is my first podcast episode now that I'm 36 and <laughs> I'm telling you like, Oh, yeah. happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Don't, this is some, some sarcasm there. Don't let the, 
36. Don't let the uh, the high pitched voice and the looks fool you. Because <laughs> she's just like, you're getting closer I'm, to me. Yeah, I'm so happy. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm just going to go freeze myself for a couple yeah, of years. Go ahead, Walt Disney. <laughs> Do your thing. So, yeah, it was, you know, it was just a beautiful thing to read because for me, where I'm at right now is is the most precious thing to me and the most valued thing to me, non people is knowledge that will help me and systems that I can mm-hmm. put into play in my life that will help me. And this was a, a, a system that I, again, basically memorized because it's, it's, and I even wrote after I highlighted, I wrote right next to the paragraph need to always remember. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I like, put two lines under the R for remember. Um, so uh, just moving on to another message here in this book that I think is important as I wrote down after I highlighted Shay, when I bring things up, <laughs> um, <laughs> he talks about how certain partners in times of conflict mm-hmm. need to take ownership into how they could be contributing mm-hmm. to the problem at hand. So he says like most people, yeah, you know, they try a few times to talk things through and make life better, but we learn quickly that such efforts either yield nothing or elicit defensiveness and escalation. And something that I've asked Shay now for years is to really try to work on her defensiveness. And he says, when we focused on, when we focus on how unheard we feel, not on how we might speak more effectively. So he said, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I butchered that. And he said, when that happens, we front load our attention on what our partners are doing wrong, not on mm-hmm. how we mm-hmm. may be contributing to the problem. We focus on how unheard we feel, not on how we might speak more effectively. So that that's me. I focus on how... I was how, just going to say, that part sounds like you. Yeah, yeah, I focus on how unheard I feel, not on how I may be speaking more effectively mm-hmm. to you. And I think oftentimes... Instead of, because like for me, in the incidents that were happening and when we were filming our episode, <laughs> I wish we would have used this alternative. Because he gives this example in the book. I wish you would have said, I'm sorry you feel bad. And he said, why not start with that compassion? Because mm-hmm. when you have compassion, it doesn't care about who's right or who's wrong. You must let go of the two orientations that toxic individualism pulls you toward. The first focus so-called objective reality is often our go-to in such moments. So for example, well, yes, I was late, but the fact is that traffic was, and he's like, no one cares about your excuses or explanations. Mm -hmm. Our second usual focus when faced with unhappy partner is most usually ourselves. Oh, come on. How many times have I waited for you? Mm -hmm. He said, sorry, no one cares about you right now. They want you to know Sorry, they want to know if you care about them. And that was, I think, Mm -hmm. the biggest problem that I had when we tried to film was I was like, you're not caring about how I feel. You're focused on your facts, right? And you're focused on, as he says, like, okay, well, how many times I've been late before? There was traffic, like all these different Mm -hmm. ways to, to defend and to excuse. So he said, think of yourself as being at a customer service window. This, this is a good example. I remember actually reading this to you in the shower. It'll make sense in a second. Someone tells you from customer service window that their microwave doesn't work. They don't want to hear that your toaster doesn't work either. (laughs) Nor are they interested in your Mm -hmm. reasons. They want a new microwave. So take care of your customer first. Only once they feel satisfied will there be any bandwidth for you and your experience. Mm -hmm. Bingo. That, I'm telling you, love, that for me is everything. Because a lot of times I'm coming to you, I'm like, my microwave broke. And you're like, well, my toaster's broke. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> Can you get me a new fucking microwave right now? Because it's it's broke. And you're yeah, like, yeah. But, but the day we were filming, you came to me with, my microwave broke because you blah, 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 blah. And mm-hmm. what you, like, because the last time you cooked in it, you had it on high power. And I'm like, actually, no, the last time I cooked on it, had it on low. Mm. So that's where I was like going back. And that's why I said like, even, you know, I've been like watching stuff on defensiveness and stuff. And they said like, 
part of that trigger could also like there's a whole criticizing piece to it where the person delivering, you know, their feelings, if they're you have to be really careful to not deliver them with your facts as well. Mm -hmm. You have to just stick to the feelings like my mic, the fact it or the basic fact of your feelings. <laughs> it's hard to use the microwave, but my microwave's not working. Not my microwave's not working because the last time you used it, right. you whatever mm -hmm. on high power. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to be like, no, I actually didn't use. So now I'm like Facts. fixated on that part where if you would have just said my microwave's not working, I would have been like, oh, shoot. Like, yeah. what could we do to fix it? You right. know? Right. Well, it leads me to the last thing I'll mention about this, this part of the book. And he talks about more on how to really repair mm -hmm. and speaking for repair. And he yeah. says he um, quotes Janet Hurley's uh, feedback wheel. And so the feedback wheel is a form of speaking that has four parts. It's a structure that you can use to organize your thoughts and more skillfully speak up when you are hurt. Again, this is called the feedback wheel. There's four parts. Here's the first part. Number one, instead of going, you know, round in circles with your feelings, start with this. Okay, so this is what I recollect happened. Mm -hmm. Right? So we'll go with the microwave thing. So I'm like, my microwave's broke. <laughs> and I'm frantic and I'm hurt and I'm sad that my microwave's broke. The feedback wheel for you, number one, is you're going to say, this is what I recollect happened. Okay, so your microwave's broke, right? Yes, my microwave's <laughs> broke. <laughs> number two, this is what I made up about it. And this, this is, is the this part is that it. you have to get better at. N Me? No, yeah. Cause you, you too. This is what I made up about it. This is exactly so like the whole, that one scenario. Wait, we just we just literally said... I said my microwave's bro broke, and you said my toaster's broke too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, it's no, hard no to like use the reference of microwave, but yeah. but I was just gonna say like when you came with your feelings, you came with like also what you made up about it that's mm -hmm. helped supporting your feelings. But right. I don't, I personally don't think that that's fair for the other person because what are they supposed to do? What if what you made up about it isn't true? Isn't true? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they're just supposed to be like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I agree. And we both do that, unfortunately, too often. And the third thing, the four is, this is what I felt. Mm -hmm. This is what I wish I could do more often to start the feedback mm -hmm. wheel with. Like, this is how I felt. Because when we were, did our podcast and we were back and forth conflicting, I wish I would have paused, taken a moment and said, this is how I, it made me feel mm -hmm. in that moment. This is how I feel now. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like facts, 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 facts. Yeah. And he said the fourth one is the all important one. And he said that most speakers leave out and it says this would help me feel better. Mm -hmm. Again, if we were able to go with this is what I felt and this would help me mm -hmm. feel better. Let's go back to the Jack and Jill I mean, I think in general, if everybody were to yeah. be able to just come with that and yeah. not the stories that they make up in their head, mm -hmm. you know, because um, that's, it's almost like I feel, sometimes I feel like I'm the guy in the relationship. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> you said that actually the other day too. You're like, what were we yeah, talking about? Yeah, because last night when I came out of this consultation, I said, you know, oh, I, I realized that I'm more feelings and you're more facts yeah because i i could be a very logical person and i feel like a and lot of that more emotional possibly comes from um i don't know me you, like you said my career. work yeah, yeah my work like for an example when i'm selling a house to a client and i'm representing the buyer or whatever side and the buyer's like i feel like the roof is old but the facts are the roof is brand new so it's like <laughs> so when you're like i feel like you didn't show up for me. I'm like, but the facts are, I actually was there, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think, um, that's a struggle for me is really trying to, in moments, like you started off by saying, like, there's a time and a place where the facts are important. Mm -hmm. And I have to find that balance where, when the time is for the facts to be important, when the time is for the feelings to be important. Mm -hmm. And during the transition of me just trying to be, um, to, I forgot what I was going to say. 
trying to sort it out which one comes and first yeah so and in the transition of just trying to sort that out and especially in moments of conflict mm-hmm. i have like just told myself okay just take a deep breath and if if you're getting the urge to like give a fact against his fact or his feelings mm-hmm. just give yourself time and yeah. And that's what I'm going to try to do. Obviously, it's like so much harder in the moment. In the moment. Yeah. Um, but I do feel there's there is so many other layers to it, because I think if you do and when you have came to me with your feelings, I was very empathetic. I'm a naturally empathetic person. Mm-hmm. It's always when you come with come to me with your feelings that are like also accusing some me of something or criticizing me of something or you know your version of the story of it yeah and i think just off the top what is going to help us with that is me healing on my own Mm -hmm. and forgiving on my own before i come to you Mm -hmm. because when i come to you at that point it might be more facts my feelings are what i'm really trying to get across but for some reason i have to lead Mm -hmm. with facts often it's because I, I haven't processed and healed from it or forgiven yet. So I'm, I'm coming to you like now it's a blow up. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's almost easier. That's why I said it's so interesting that it's easier for people to come with their actionable feelings rather yeah. than just being like, <coughs> that fucking hurt me. Yeah. I'm really sad about that. Right this is what I felt mm-hmm. and this would help me feel better. But it's like you allow those emotions to take over your body and then you're like, you know, you're like, mad or whatever it's like your your gesture your voice it's like Mm -hmm. your feelings are like fueling into your body where it's like showing more than expressing Mm -hmm. verbally yeah makes sense yeah for sure and then naturally the other person's like on the defense because the voice is raised the Mm -hmm. body language is heat hot you feel attacked yeah you feel like you gotta hurry up there's that's that anxious feeling of like Mm -hmm. i gotta get my side out because this is wrong yeah that's not what i meant to do and and if we can just all slow down again, we're reading a book. We're sitting here. This is our fifth time talking about <laughs> this incident. So like we're a little bit more calm, cool, collected. But the point of all of this is to really try to instead of like, well, this is what I made up about it. Leading with facts, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It's listening with empathy. That's like one of the main things the author stresses in this book when it comes to conflict resolution and repairs. Listening with empathy. Mm-hmm. And say, okay, well, this is what I recollect happened. This is what I felt. And this would make me feel better. If we can really try to do that more often, I think we will all be way better and off. My response would be, I'm sorry you felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, I want to like go back a little bit to what you were saying about trying to decide between which, which is more important right now, the facts or the feelings. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure people are like, yeah, how do you decide that? Let me know. <laughs> well, I mean, let's. Tr- I'm going to try to take a stab at it. Mm-hmm. Number one, it's circumstantial, right? E- not, not everything is a copy-paste solution here. I do think read the room. Mm-hmm. It will help if you're with a partner that you've been with for a while, as you talked about last night, which I'd love to get into after this point, the rhythm of a relationship. Mm-hmm. But read the room, understand your partner, understand like, are, just ask yourself, are my facts really that important right now over his or her feelings? Mm-hmm. Because he or she is, is crying. They're emotional right now. Like, this is this is digging deep. Like, mm-hmm. what would it take to make them feel better? Right? Mm-hmm. Is this how you feel? Okay, what would it take for me to make you feel better? Mm-hmm. Like, go with that. So, yeah. I think just read the room, assess the situation. And if you can't, take take a walk. Take a step back for a second. Let it, let it marinate for a little while because... It might just be a situation where you two are both adding fuel to this fire and it's not going to get anywhere. I'm also a huge proponent of go to sleep mad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, uh, no offense, honey, but like go to sleep mad. I know it's not really your your MO, but and it's not old people's MO because anytime (laughs) I meet an old couple, they're like, don't go to sleep mad. It's like the number one advice they give. I'm like, the hell with that, because I would rather go to sleep mad and let let a night happen. Let myself process and then if it's really that important the next morning, th- great, we can talk about it. But now I'm like, I'm collected. I'm going to mm-hmm. respond instead of react. Because if, if if we're just going to go back and forth, it's just going to be all reaction I mean, based. I think there's a way to, to not talk about it, but still also not go to sleep mad. I think once you have trust in a relationship, like, listen, yeah. we're not getting anywhere tonight. Let's put right. a pin in it. Let's allow ourselves time yeah. and go to sleep 
peaceful. So that reminds me, because Jill, again, consultation last night, she basically said that. She said, even though we fight, I would like to fight with love. Mm -hmm. And me and Jack were like, here we go. (laughs) You know, like, (laughs) it's such a a woman thing to say. It's It's so easier said than done. Like, because him and I were, we just had like a moment. I'm like, well, why would we fight? Just let's just have the Mm -hmm. love part. You know what I mean? But I get it. It's it's not always that simple. But I think it, it comes with time, like that part of it, because you're still like, I mean, even with us being together six years, there's still levels of trust that we don't have in our relationship yet. And I feel like that comes, that comes through time, more adversity moments where Mm -hmm. we can build, like give us and learn and learn and stuff. So, (laughs) so I feel that eventually a couple can get to the level where whatever they're fighting about, they trust that they're going to resolve it and get to a place of, of resolution. Yeah. So it allows them to be able to go to sleep, even if it's not resolved that night. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, trust can, that it will yeah, the next day. Will. Yeah. <sighs> you need a water break. By the way, this episode is sponsored by Yeti. It is? No. <laughs> not yet. It will be. Um, comment if, if, like, what's your favorite water bottle? My, this is a total side note, but these Yetis, I don't leave the house without them. They are in every nook and cranny of the home. I'm using them every single day. Do you like them better than that one that you did the... the the job for Ivana. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. Really? Why? Yeah. Although I, I like s- the Ivana. I, I I like the Ivana straw situation. Like it had like a built-in sip straw situation where like this yeti have to flip to get the straw, so it's like one extra step. But I did I do like that about Ivana. But no, they didn't really keep my stuff as cold as this yeti does. This thing mm-hmm. is like a, f- a freezer if I put in some cold and a furnace if I put in some hot. Um, so shout out to Yeti. Hopefully (laughs) sponsor soon. Anyways, um, I want to talk about, you mentioned yesterday, which is a good point of the rhythm of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think other people would call it a season, um, a flow, right? Obviously, but it was a good point that you said about the rhythm thing. So I just want you to unpack a little bit more. I'm trying to remember what I said. (laughs) I I think... um, I think what was I talking about that made me say it? I think I have a friend who's kind of in a new relationship and they're going through the discovery phase right. of um, just how to coincide mm-hmm. their ways of being with one another and um, the way they both handle holidays and other certain things in their relationship. And I told her, I was like, it's, all of that stuff is very normal. Like anytime you're colliding two separate lives, you, it's almost like you have to find your rhythm of dance with your partner. You know, it's like you, you're not just gonna, you know, like it's almost like you have to find the beat to the song and then you guys just have to like find your flow. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that takes time and it takes so much time. And in fact, during our rhythm of dance of finding, like he thought that that was just like not, and maybe it's because you're not a dancer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can dance. <laughs> <laughs> just choose not to. <laughs> but during our finding our rhythm. Actually, the I last time I really danced. You want to take a when guess? When was the last time like, you like really, really danced? Let like, really I would it loose. love to see your like dance moves. Like, sweating on the dance floor. W- never. No, I, I'm not. <laughs> what your, your guess is never? I My have done it before. Is you've never danced. No. 1993. You got, like, just like a little, like. 1993. <laughs> was the last time. what song was that no i specifically remember it was my sister's wedding wow and i, I still Lisa, am, can I, you get married again because i need to see this man dance i am known for that night mm, i was six old years old oh my god six years old and man i don't know who i thought i was but i just i was getting it that's hilarious and i had a tux yeah like my mom had to pull me off the dance floor I was that's just, probably where 93 that was probably the last time you were so pure within yourself. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you were free. Oh my God. You were free <laughs> from all of your- 30 years ago. No, you were free from all of your traumas. All I didn't of have trauma. Well, exactly. I did actually. I, no, I did have traumas That's then. At six years old? Yeah. I had traumas younger than that, okay. unfortunately. 
Um, but maybe you hadn't processed them no, yet, so you right. were still free and like yeah. not controlling of yourself. And now I yeah. feel like you're just like calculated. Calculated. You can't relax. <sighs> Definitely have not. You seen make him it on sound like floor. I'm just some wound up <laughs> robot that's just like nonstop. Le- okay, let me see some <laughs> dance moves. I'm sitting down, but look, <laughs> all I'm saying is, I. <laughs> all we're, I'm saying we're is going to a club. Ninety three was the last time I really was on the dance floor like that okay i was dancing so. at our wedding just three years ago she yeah, forgot like already a, a one two step okay <laughs> would you want me to do line dance if we moved to texas i told him the first week if we moved to texas my ass off. the first week he has to get some cowboy boots i'll a get cowboy a, hat. a hat boots a belt i'll have the spurs <laughs> on the back <laughs> i'll I develop an accent imagine if that's what it takes to get that six bedroom country. house i don't think you would actually go through with that my golf simulator if listen i'm gonna tell you right now <laughs> this is being recorded if, if we're all witness here you better not cut this part out i'm not if we go there and we get our house that we've been wanting i'll i'll do what i'll sing dance no it's if we all move the to above Texas, not no i'm saying we won't get the house right away the house that we want right away but just moving to texas no no it's, we're gonna get the house right away we can <laughs> it's everything's on sale <laughs> outside of california <laughs> jesus this place is crazy out here um, everyone. okay so going back to rhythm a rhythm yeah. in a relationship right when we were trying to find our Ooh, that's rhythm, good rhythm in a relationship yeah i was i knew that that was completely normal you know i'm like when you're dancing with someone for the first time you got to feel their flow like see mm-hmm. you know Who takes the lead yeah, and he thought that that was just like not what he signed up for. No, I, I thought I would I could take the lead. Oh yeah, and then I realized uh, I can't dance to this song. And then you realized you this never kind of music dance. So yeah. yeah, but anyways, the rhythm is very important, and I think it's also going to help assess how and when one establishes is this a fact conversation or a feeling conversation Mm -hmm. and and i also think too it's and i said this in the consultation with jack and jill there's a big factor here that we haven't mentioned in conflict resolution and repair and that is trust Mm -hmm. and you mentioned this earlier like there's still some trust things that we don't really have locked down in our relationship the trust thing we don't really have locked Mm -hmm. down in our relationship yet is trusting that If we go to bed tonight mad, Mm -hmm. we'll wake up tomorrow and either still be fine or revisit the conversation. Mm -hmm. We don't really have the full trust in our relationship to let someone go Mm -hmm. first. And sometimes that that could have nothing to do. Like she just cut me off now. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I thought that was the moment of. (laughs) Perfect example. that was like a She didn't trust that she's going to have the opportune time. Sometimes you say you ramble and I'm like trying to insert myself. Okay, go. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> we don't have the trust to let the other person go first without interruption, with listening with empathy, and with listening to understand, not reply. Like we mm-hmm. don't we don't have that when it comes to when we're really triggered and there's conflict on on mm-hmm. the table here. Yeah. And so trust is such a big part of it. And that's why I think a lot of people who are in, in a new relationship or dating, <sighs> God help you, because We just figured this out, (laughs) like, the other day. Maeve, speak. I'm done. (laughs) (laughs) But I do feel like sometimes the trust doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the other person. It might be a trust thing that you just don't have in what you have in front of you. Like, for an example, like, you always say that you've never trusted marriage. It could be be the relationship you have with that. It could be the relationship you have with yourself. It could be the relationship that you've, you've had with everyone who is supposed to love you in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that sometimes it's like so many different um, factors play into play with the whole trust thing. And, Mm -hmm. and a lot of times the healing that will allow you to trust might have like is inside. Yeah. And that just takes from, you know, comes from working on yourself. The healings from within. That's what I meant to say. Healings from within. Yeah. And it's a choice by the way so Mm -hmm. and it's not easy it's no hell no very you have to be very conscious and it's not easy but it's worth it Mm -hmm. and and take it from my 
testimonial. It is, it has been worth it. It has been, um, one of the most proud things I have and I am in my life. And it's something that I definitely can credit as the reason why we're still rolling. My relationships are still rolling. Um, is that humility and understanding like you might have to, you might be the problem. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, class is over. So should we talk about more important things? Yeah. So what's your handicap? The people <laughs> who are non-golfers are going to be like, what the hell did she just say? <laughs> no. For you guys, first of all, if you saw <laughs> what we're watching behind the camera, he's Listen, half here. I'm all here but (laughs) tiger's also here too and (laughs) tiger's back today is thursday he has his golf shirt on february 16th and there's a this is the first day of a new tournament uh for everyone who doesn't know anything about golf tournaments 99 percent of the time are thursday through sunday so thursday is the first day and tiger decided to play in this tournament he hasn't played since i think july so it's the goat but i'm here (laughs) <laughs> I was very, I get an A for participation. I, I know, I'm just Productive kidding. here, two two for I one just, right now. I just love to see your face light up, and the only thing that does it is... Tiger? <laughs> Pause. Is a golf topic. <laughs> no, nah, man, this, this thing. Like, when you edit, can you just zoom in on your face when I asked you what your handicap was? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm proud of it, man. It's single digits for the golfers who, who do know. It's a 9.2. <laughs> they don't want the smoke because it's and i'm only getting better and i'm reading david goggins right now this is i'm on another level i'm on i said this before we said around like i i in my life all seriousness no more golf talk <clears throat> i am on another level right now i'm optimal as i, I would say because the last time people saw his me, abs are back guys my abs are back <laughs> that is a fact Forget the feelings. That's a fact. Let's focus <laughs> on the facts of that. This is where the facts are. Because that shit has been hard as hell. God, did I take for granted 26 years old. <sighs> Anyways, um, the last time the people saw me and heard me, I was getting a coaching, therapy, I- intervention, whatever you want to call it with Lauren. Mm-hmm. It was great. Um, and I've, I've made just a total 180 since then, which is in real time been like uh, five weeks, I think. So I just I'm I'm running with this new wave. It is a new year, new me for sure, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm I'm really happy and proud of it. So, but anyways, <clears throat> class is over. Thank you for ev- uh hello. <laughs> Thank you everyone <laughs> for still sticking around, listening and or watching. Um, sorry it took so long to have this episode. I, I know I kept alluding to it and then it never showed up. And um, so again. It's a wrap. Season two. Oh, another topic. Finances. Not a wrap. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be teaching that class. <laughs> yeah. One of the books that I've read so far this year is uh, I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. I think. By the way, I got him this book like four years ago. 2018. Five years ago. Jesus. So I'm very, very excited that yeah. I finally read it. And now... He's teaching me stuff about finances and what we need to do. Yeah. And if you listened or watched the resentment episode, our finances were a big piece to our issues in our relationship. So better late than never. But um, uh, and it reminds me, I'll put the us book. I'll put the I'll teach you to be rich book um, in the link below in the description. You guys can buy it. Do what you want to do. Um, but yeah, plenty of topics. I'm excited for season three and uh, feel free to come up with any two, honey. Okay, it's a wrap. Thank you again for everyone for your patience, for your love, for your support, for your encouragement. Um, if if I have responded to your DM or your message or your comment, you know that I respond to every single one. Thank you for the ones who left voice notes. Mm. Listen carefully. Uh, <laughs> I don't read long texts. I just can't. Or he'll have me read them. Or I'll have Shay read them. I don't even have a voicemail. Like that just should go to show you. Like that's how I am with like certain things. But the voicemail uh, is like a voice note. Voicemails give me anxiety why because it's like what do they say what do they have to what do i need to do it just makes me anxious so i just i haven't had a voicemail <laughs> since like 2013 to be honest it's been 10 years actually if it's that important they'll email or text so anyways well, no one really leaves voicemails anymore i wouldn't yeah. know 
Anyways, we will see you guys very soon. Thank you. Love you all. And we are out. Say goodbye, play. Say bye. <laughs> That's your goodbye? Ow. That's your goodbye? <laughs> okay. Bless you, play. Okay. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>